left off yesterday, after having spoken about, not yesterday, the last time we spoke, about Yehuda's approaching Yosef, we spoke about how he spoke to him and said many times, my master, my master, my master, with the intent of addressing Hashem simultaneously. We spoke about how he could say to Hashem, you're like Paro, meaning Hashem c controls the forces of evil as well. We then spoke about how he lost years of his life, 10 years of his life, for the 10 times he heard his father refer to as a servant. Okay, do you have any questions about last time? Okay, we go on. Now we have to go a lot faster today because we're getting to the end of the week. Okay, so first I'm gonna tell you the entire narrative and then we'll go back and discuss a few of the ideas. Okay, so after, after their encounter, Yosef couldn't hold himself back anymore. He asked everybody to leave the room and he said, I'm Yosef. Is my father still alive? I Meaning, could he have lived through everything? Okay, he, and he reminded them. He said, You're, you sold me to Egypt, but don't feel saddened about this because this is all from Hashem in order that I be able to save you in these years of hunger. So then, he says this again. I want you to hear this Pasuk. You took Chumashim with you. This is a critical Pasuk. If you took Chumashim, open up to Perek, Mem He Pasuk Chet. It's an extremely important puzzle. Okay. So digit numbers would be um, chapter 45, and there you would look for sentence number eight. Of course, they do you the favor, no doubt, of having it in Roman digits also, which makes things worse. Okay, I've often wondered two things. I have two things. If these things were clear, I would know everything. Why people still use Roman digits, which is beyond me, and why Chumashim are still printed with Rashi print? Okay, this is like, why? Okay, yes, he didn't have a press. Yes, he had to devise his own script, but that was like, what's a thousand years between good friends? Okay, so here's the Pasuk. Viata and now. Lo atem shalach nemoti. You didn't send me, Hena, to hear. Kelohim, but Hashem. Vyasimenu la of the Paro, and he made me Paro's father. Vila Adon Lachobeto and the master of his house. Moshel Bachal Eretz Mitzrayim and the ruler of the land of Egypt. So here are the two big ideas here. One is you didn't send me, God sent me. So that leaves us with a question, but wait a minute, didn't they have a role? Did they have a role as, of his ending up in Egypt or didn't they have a role? So a, so a messenger does the, the will of the one who sent him. Okay, so a human messenger could do this even against his own will. So this is a huge idea. So a person could want to do something, but since ultimately everybody is Hashem's messenger, the outcome of their desires will be what Hashem wanted. So if you really integrate this, you'll understand how, let's say, blaming a doctor for a mistake that took place in surgery is irrational because this doctor was Hashem's messenger, but his intentions were bad. Let's say he was negligent. So his, his bad intentions brought about a bad result. Does it sometimes happen that a, a doctor who's negligent gets off the hook, he really doesn't do any harm. It works. Does that happen sometimes? Yeah. All the time. So that's also because he's Hashem's messenger. That even though he chose wrong, Hashem wanted an outcome that's right. Can you say that about any person? Yes. So this is what I want you to understand very clearly because this will change your attitude towards life and will significantly reduce your rage towards events and people. Okay? So again, a person could choose wrong and the outcome will be terrible. A person could choose wrong and the outcome could be good. So the outcome doesn't belong to the person, only the choice belongs to the person. People are accountable for their choices. So it's not like, oh, he'll get off, he, meant, he, meant to, he was negligent and he killed someone, but it's nothing because that was what Hashem wanted anyway. No, he's accountable for his choice. So there's a true story, this happened around 50 years ago. There was a violent demonstration in, okay, I know this will shock you, in Israel, I don't know if you realize this, all demonstrations in Israel are violent. Did you know this? 
It's not like America, but demonstrations here are always violent. Take this as like an axiom, never go to demonstrations, you don't know, where, you don't know what the end of the story will be. Okay, so there was a violent demonstration in B'nai Brak. I don't remember what the demonstration was about. Was a, there was, I think it was, there was a time when the hospitals took possession of people who were in the hospital, so you had no choices as to treatment or as to whether or not to have an autopsy. I think it was about that, but I'm not sure. So in the, in the course of the, um, of the demonstration, somebody threw a rock at a police car, and it broke the window, and it hit the policeman, but he was okay. In other words, the window broke the force of the rock, but he was okay. So somebody said, mentioned this event to one of the great mashkichim in Panovich Yeshiva. So he called a large town meeting. People, thousands of people came. They didn't know what he was going to be talking about. Their expectation, of course, would be he would talk, who would, that he'd be talking about the evil of the hospitals taking possession of their patients, but that's not what he spoke about. He was a very dramatic speaker. He began by saying, there's a murderer amongst us. So somebody went up and whispered to him, the policeman's okay. And he said, that doesn't matter. The man who threw the rock is a murderer. Hashem saved the policeman. But the person who could throw a rock through a window is a murderer. You understand this? Okay, so the person is accountable for their choices. Nobody, nobody can make a bad choice without paying a bill. But that doesn't mean that the results will be terrible. So you do have a basic underlying rule, which the human eye cannot always interpret easily, which is, in a general sense, Hashem will cause bad things to happen through people who need to have this happen through them. And good things will happen through people who need to have that happen through, through them. So that means if a person, let's say, causes a fatal accident through no fault of their own, there was a, somebody spilled oil on the road, the car spun out of control, it's not their fault. But the fact that they're the one who Hashem used tells them something about themselves. They're supposed to learn something from this situation. So if a person really integrates this, their entire attitude towards life changes. So when you do something wrong, you, you should say, what's this taking, what's this teaching me? There's a reason why I'm the one who Hashem chooses to use as his you messenger. Can't say it's your, your fault that something happened, but you can You could say the event, the outcome is not my fault, but my involvement is telling me something. It's for yourself. In other words, the event would have taken place no matter what. If you made a bad choice, you're accountable for your choice. If you didn't make a bad choice, you still have to question your involvement. So there was a, this, something happened, this is just a, a short time ago, a few years ago, three years ago, four years ago, in Harnof, where um, a mother with small children was getting off the bus. So she did it right, she got everybody onto the sidewalk. The bus driver began closing the doors. This whole thing took seconds. For reasons that nobody will ever find out, the four-year-old went back onto the bus, or tried to get back onto the bus, as the door was closing. The door closed, he had one of these lunch bags on. You know what I mean? So it closed on the straps. So he w the mother saw him run over by the bus. Okay, so the bus driver, whose fault this wasn't, he saw them all on the, on the sidewalk. And the child was too short for him to see in the mirrors. Okay, clear? So he still felt terrible about this because he's a human being. So he went to the shiva. What did he expect? Be him. You go to the shiva just to say, this is a terrible thing. I'm terribly sorry this happened. What would you expect the people to respond to you with? Anger. Even though it wasn't his fault, you would expect anger. And this is Israel. Anger could be, you know, okay, anger isn't, oh, I'm, I'm terribly upset. Anger is, you know, okay. Instead, they were sitting in two different rooms. The men and women were different rooms. He went right to the father. And the father said, do you think I think for a minute that God decides life and death by where, your, by where the mirrors on your bus is? This is from God. I found out enough about the accident. I realized you didn't do anything wrong. Forgive yourself. Okay, you understand this? So you have to have a very deep level of understanding to be able to do this. So I want to give you again the picture, something bad happens. If you made a choice, you're accountable for your choice. If you didn't make a choice, you're accountable for your involvement. The same thing happens for something good, which is what we have in the text. 
the brothers made a bad choice, so they still have to question their involvement, which you don't see them doing so much as yet. But the outcome was good. So what Yosef is saying is God chose you to bring about a good outcome, then there's something righteous in you, so don't be grieved. Okay, so that's one important lesson of the, of the sentence. But another lesson is listen to what Yosef says. He says, because God made me the father of Paro. Now, was he Paro's father or not? No. So Rashi asks, how could he call himself Paro's father? I want you to hear the answer because this gives you insight into parenthood. He says, the role of a father is to be what Yosef was to Paro, which is what? What was Yosef's relationship to Paro? What was he in Paro's life? Okay, so he says, this is, if you look in Rashi, those of you who have Chumashim open, you may as well take a glimpse at Rashi, it won't kill you. He says, l'chaver patron, to be a friend and a patron. This is the job of a father. So when you say a father is meant to be a friend, a friend is somebody who has commonality and empathy towards somebody. A patron is somebody who sees their role as providing for someone so that they could grow. So this is the role of a father. So when a child is young, their primary role is patron. But as the child grows older, their primary role changes from patron to friend. Okay, let's go further. Okay, so he says, hurry up. Bring my father here and tell him, this is what your son Yosef says. Hashem has made me the master of all Egypt. Come down here, don't stay. And you'll live in the land of Goshen and you'll be near me. You and your children and your grandchildren, your animals, everything you own, and I'll support you because there's still going to be five more years of famine. Why should you be impoverished? You and your household and everything you have. Okay, your eyes will see me. Okay, and you'll see, and you see before you now that I've sent back Benjamin, and you could see now with whose mouth is speaking to you. And tell my father all of the glory that I have here in Egypt and everything that you've seen. Hurry and bring him down here. He then fell upon, Yo um, upon Binyamin, his brother's neck, and he wept. And Binyamin wept on his neck. Okay, clear? So now we have another two questions. Okay, one is he's telling them to come, which makes sense. Well, what is Eretz Goshen? What's the land of Goshen? And why is he saying this is where you'll live? Is it the name of a district? Is it the name of another country? What is it? So Gosh, uh, do you know? It's a city that was given to Sarah and Avraham. Yes, it's a city that was given to Sarah and Avraham. So it's a land that was given to Sarah by Paro. It's also a land that would keep them separate from the Egyptians. So he could have easily said, go to any one of the main cities in Itros, Patros, which still exists now in Egypt, existed then. Ramses existed then. He could have said, go to the equivalent of New York or Los Angeles. But instead he said, and you'll live in Wichita. <laughs> okay, clear. Okay, you've always wanted to be in Boys, Idaho, haven't you? Yeah. So the intention was for them to live in a separate district. Why do you think that was important for him to tell his father at this moment? In a basic sense, the role of Jews involves being a light to the world. But in order to be the light to the world, you have to be yourself. So I want you to focus upon the idea of diffused light as opposed to focused light. So diffused light is where you have a light even of, of, of significant strength, but it's very far. So if it's very far, it could be all over the place, like when you hold a flashlight from a distance from the room that you're in. So a flashlight in a dark room will give some light to even the darkest corners. But if you want to read, you need the flashlight near, near the page, right? So the reason is that non-diffused light is more intense than diffused light. This is, by the way, in physics, an important, <laughs> this is an important rule in physics and understanding energy. But um, in any case, so for the Jews to have an effect, they have to create an intense level of light, which happens when their light isn't diffused by their taking over the culture. And Weltanschauung, how is that for a word that you don't use frequently, of the nations. 
So the way that works is let's say there is let's say there's a girl in this in this class from uh, New York. Will she have a different outlook towards life without knowing anything else about her from a, than a girl from Mexico City? Yeah. Why is that? Put it into words. Culture. The culture. So there are two levels of influence. One influence level of influence is subconscious and general, and the other is conscious and specific. So the influence of the society of a whole is subconscious and general. So nobody makes a plan, I want to be suspicious of everybody I see and therefore I'll go to live in New York, okay? It sort of kind of happens <laughs> just by being there, okay? So, you know, like I have, I have so many New York stories, but you know, asking somebody near, like on 42nd Street, my watch up, do you have the time? <laughs> you get the look. Don't you have a watch? <laughs> okay. Okay, could you picture this? Okay. Um, I'm being lost in Flatbush, like this isn't even 42nd Street, in Flatbush, in a Jewish area. I look for a house with a mezuzah, I knock the door, they open the door this much, and I said, I'm looking for this and this family. They don't even say a word, they hand me a phone book so I could look it up. I love New York, <laughs> okay, whatever. So you pick it up subconsciously. So your sense of normalcy comes from the outside society. Your definition of normal is formulated at what age? No, no. Somewhere between four and seven. Your sense of what normal behavior is, what a normal society is, normal relationships is already pretty well in cement. So you could change from there, but you know, you could say, I want to be different, but this is your normal. So that comes from the outer society. There's another kind of influence, this is from Rambam, which is the influence of friends and family, which is conscious. The effect of society is subconscious. The effect of the influence of friends and family is conscious. How so? Everybody wants to have validation from their family and friends. Is that true? So in order to have that, we sometimes consciously try to focus on what draws us together, what we share in common. So you'll find yourself assimilating your beliefs and opinions to those of the people with whom you are at a given time if you care about them. So um, there was a Woody Allen, do any of you watch Woody Allen movies? Okay, so did you see Zelig? Oh, that's my favorite, okay, whatever. So in Zelig, which is an ancient movie, I don't know what it's from, the 60s, whatever. Okay, so he became, his main character was Zelig, but he became whoever he was talking to. So when he was talking to a black person, he became black. When he was talking to a woman, he became a woman. Okay, clear? Do we do this subconsciously to some degree? Okay, so that's the effect of people who we care about, which is much deeper. So because of this, in order for Yaakov to want to leave Israel and go to Egypt, Yosef has to assure him, you'll live in Goshen. You're not going to become an Egyptian. You don't have to worry that your grandchildren won't know who they are. Okay, so at the end of this portion says that he wept at Binyamin's neck, and Binyamin wept on his neck. What's strange about this? The usage of the word neck, okay, it's strange. So bear with me. The Midrash says that he wept at Binyamin's neck because he foresaw the destruction of the two temples. Binyamin wept on his neck because he, Binyamin, foresaw that the tabernacle in Shiloh, which was in Yosef's portion of the land, would be destroyed. Does that make it easier or harder? Harder. So in Shir Hashirim, the Beis Hamikdash was called the neck. So the Beis Hamikdash is what took who we are in potential in our minds and souls and made it happen with our bodies. It connected the head to the body. So he, who we yearn to be, who we want to be, was actualized in the, in the Beis Hamikdash. Not only that, but oftentimes, I'm sure this has happened to you and not only to me, have you gone to the hotel and you want to say but you have no words? Okay. I came. <laughs> okay. So, uh, so the Beis Hamikdash gave us such intense clarity that we found the words. 
we found the words. So it was the place in which the mind and the body were together and the words came. Okay, and not only that, it was the place where even consuming, eating, and breathing took on spiritual meaning. So because of that, it's called the neck. So where was the Beis HaMikdash located? So certainly all of the tribes wanted it in their portion. How, was it, how, how did they even know where to build it? Do you know? The Torah doesn't tell us. They had to figure it out. Nope. It tells them how to build it in great detail. Okay, so the, the place of the Beis HaMikdash, Har Habayit, is where the Akedah took place. So there, when Hashem told Avraham to go sacrifice Yitzchak, he refers to it at the end as the mountain upon which I could be seen. So because of this, they understood that this is the place for building the Beis HaMikdash. So this place, Har Habayit, was located when the conquest took place after the years in the desert they conquered Israel. It took place under King David. It was owned by somebody called Arnona HaYavusi, which is good for you Judaica trivia. Okay, and what's the name of the original owner? Okay, whatever. So, um, so he could have taken it militarily, but he chose to buy it. Why do you think he chose to buy it? So it should be undisputed, and also because Yerushalayim, what we just said, connecting the mind to the, to the heart, to the body, that only happens through giving. It doesn't happen through taking. If you want something of Yerushalayim to be part of you, you have to give. And not only do you have to give, but you have to give of yourself. So because of this, he collected the money with which to purchase it from all of Israel. He didn't use the money in the treasury so that everybody could say, I own a part of Yerushalayim. So it was open to all of the tribes, but it was located in a crossroad between Binyamin and Yehuda. So Yosef prophesized that Binyamin had the traits, meaning his mind and his heart were connected enough that it would have to be his portion where the Beis HaMikdash was, but he also saw where the brothers were at, and he knew that it would be destroyed. Okay, clear? Now, before the Beis HaMikdash was built, they built a tabernacle in Israel that's called the Mishkan, which again we'll see the narrated in great detail later. And it was in the portion of who? Of Yosef. So Binyamin could see that all, the same way Yosef saw that they hadn't reached the point of perfection, neither had Yosef. So Binyamin predicted its destruction as well, and this is why they wept. Okay, next. So he kissed all of his brothers, and he wept with them because he foresaw that all of the ten tribes would be ultimately exiled. And the voice came in Paro's house, and I said, Yosef's brothers came. Paro liked the idea, and Paro said to Yosef, tell your brothers, this is what they should do. Load up your animals, come, leave Canaan, take your father, take their household. I'll give them the best of Egypt. They'll eat from the fat of the land. Okay, And people prepared wagons for them, and he said, and don't worry about your possessions. You'll, we'll buy more here. Okay, and so Yosef got them ready in this way, and he gave each one of the brothers an outfit of clothes, but to Binyamin, he additionally gave 300 pieces of silver and, f and five outfits of clothes. And to his father, he sent 10 donkeys that were loaded with everything good of Egypt. Ask a question here. There'd be something here that should puzzle you. Why did he give them Isn't that stupid? Like, he ended up, <laughs> remember his striped coat? Yeah. That, like, this seems to be something extremely stupid to do. So the reason he did, I want you to understand this, this is still part of the test. So the initial part of the test was whether they would sacrifice themselves for Binyamin, when Binyamin was suffering, when he said, you're the one who has the goblet in your pack. The question is, how will they relate to Binyamin if he's chosen and selected? So this is still part of the test, which they passed. Okay, 
And the other is, why is the details about what he sent to his father? So the reason there, which Rashi says, is that the last halacha he had learned with his father was the halacha of Egla Arufa, which, is, uh, which you've never heard of, probably. Any of you heard of it? I'm zeroing on, on you. You're our only possibility, the white hope of Gesher. There, OK, OK. But even she failed you, OK? OK. So they learned the halach of Egla Arufa, and the idea of sending Agalot was meant to remind him of this. So we have three questions concerning this. What's Egla Arufa? How did Yaakov know halacha? And what does this have to do with wagons? OK? So I'm going to answer this in order. There's a law that's narrated in Chumash Devarim. Suppose a body is found between two cities. And nobody knows what happened to this person. The evidence on the body is that the person might have been, um, they might have died of exposure to the elements, or they might have died of hunger, or they might have died by violence. We don't know how they died, OK? So what do you do? Which city has to take responsibility for the death of this person? They measure the distance between the body and the two cities. And whichever city is closer has to take responsibility. How do they take responsibility? The elders of the city have to, the body has to be taken to a stream that, and um, an egel, an egel is a calf, a calf that has not yet been used in agricultural work or any other kind of work has to be taken. Okay, so by the stream, the elders of the city, okay, have to proclaim, we haven't spilled this man's blood. And then, the calf is killed through being beheaded. It's a very strange ritual, is it not? So the idea is the, val the underlying ideas here are what we spoke about before. Remember, we spoke about tragic events and accountability. And we said that people are accountable for their choices, but even if they made no negative choice, they're accountable for what? Their the involvement. OK, clear? So a body is found between two cities. The city which is nearer is considered to be the involved city. The elders of the city are responsible for the spiritual level of the city. So if something is, is wrong there, you could, the buck stops there. It stops with the elders. Why are the people in this city in a position to make choices that are not good? You understand this? It's your deal. So I have terrible news. Want to hear the terrible news? No. What? No. OK, time's up. No, no, no. Really terrible news, much worse, OK? OK, would you say you're in Geshe, right? Do you think that if you were to look at all of the Jews in the world, that you know more than most of them or less than most of them? More. More. Bring it up to 70%. If you were to look at 70% of the Jews in the world, you know more or less? Probably more. More. Bring it up to 80% of the Jews. Do you know more or less? It's shaky. OK, clear? But you have to go up to 80% before it even gets shaky. Is that true or not? Yeah. And now for the news. Guess who's responsible for the spiritual state of all of the other Jews in the world? Uh, yeah. OK, you're welcome. Anything else I could do for you? <laughs> <laughs> OK, so the elders, it's not a, it's not a biological statement of, of age. It's a statement of wisdom. If you know more, you're accountable. So the elders of the city have to say, we have not shed this blood, meaning there's nothing we could have done that would have brought the people of the city to a place where this couldn't have happened. Let's say he wasn't murdered, because again, we're not talking necessarily about a murder. So when a person leaves the city, you're supposed to send them out with supplies, with the ways, you know, with everything they need to reach their destination safely. If you don't, what does that say about you? Doesn't mean you're a murderer. What does it say about you? Think New York. That you really don't care about this person. They're a stranger to you. Like you're not going to do them any harm, but that doesn't mean you want any positive involvement either. Okay, could you picture this? I'll tell you a true story about me. When I was in seminary many moons ago, um, I was learning in this, the Beis Yaakov in Bnei Brak. And like in all seminaries, after they served lunch, there were always 
They would serve on like serving trays, not like here where people take their own portions. They would serve on serving trays, and they'd put the serving trays in the middle of the table. There was always left over on the serving trays. They served more than enough. So in those days, I don't want to shock you. Remember, this was like thousands of years ago when people were like coming out of the caves and starting city-states and, you know, whatever. So in those days, they didn't have like a whole crew of servants to take care of the Sem girls. We had to take care of ourselves. So we had to serve the food. We had to clear off the tables and wipe them down and bring them to the kitchen. And we had kitchen toranut. Okay. So I was on Kitchen Toranut one day. There were a lot of girls, so you didn't, the Toranut didn't happen very often. But when it did, it did. Okay. So, um, I, so I was taking the serving trays. I was throwing all of the food into the garbage. So one of the Israeli girls said, what are you doing? That's clean food. So I said, yeah, but who's going to eat it? Like, there are two, you know, two portions of chicken. Like, there are 800 girls, not 800, but there are a lot of girls here. Who's, what are we going to do with two portions of chicken? So she said, have you noticed? When you go down Rabbi Akiva Street, which is the main street in B'nai Brak, have you noticed that there are beggars? And I said, yeah. Now, what's the New York thing to say? Because I knew where she was going. Yeah, but I don't want to be involved with them. OK, clear. So, so she said, pack it. Okay. <laughs> so she showed me how, because I came with absolutely no knowledge of anything practical. Like, how do you begin to pack food? OK, whatever. So. <laughs> So, you know, we packed the food, and I said, uh, look, you could do whatever you want, but I don't want to be involved. I don't know these people. I don't want to be involved with them. They could be, I don't know what they are. I don't know how they ended up this way in life. They're homeless. I, you could hear the whole speech. I said, what's the worst thing that could happen? Okay, you answered that. I had to think. What's the worst thing that could happen? I bring packaged food to some beggar on Rechov Rabbi Akiva. What's the worst thing that could happen? But they reject it. And then what will I do? Throw it out. <laughs> okay, got it. <laughs> so she said, you know, so she made like she made me go with her to give it out, and you know, surprise. Not so, I mean, it was shocking to me, but uh, but naturally, people of course like freshly made hot, good food. You know. Okay. So why am I telling you this? Is the reason I'm telling you this. So when you care about somebody, you see when they leave you that, that they have what they need. And if you don't, it means you don't really care. You've, you've turned them into something other. So again, enter my head. Homeless is other. Could you see this equation? So the word for cruel in Hebrew is achzar. Cruelty is achzar. A cruel person is achzar. The word achzar is a combination of two words. Ach and Zar, which means only a stranger. Cruelty comes from estrangement. Could you see where this is so? So in this ritual, the elders have to say, we haven't spilled his blood, meaning we haven't taught the people of our city to see strangers as being estranged. Okay. But then you have the ritual with cutting off the calf's head. What's that about? So it has to be a calf that hasn't ever done work, meaning it could do work, it could be productive, but it's cut off. What do you think that has to do with a murder or, or neglect? This person who you don't even know could have been someone. It's your neglect or your bloodshed that cut him off. He could have been productive. Okay, so the way animal sacrifice works, in short, Okay, because I don't want another visitation, right? In short, <laughs> is that we have what's called the animal soul. The animal soul is the instinctive self. The instinctive self is not compassionate. Could you see where this is so? The instinctive self is selfish. So the instinctive self is also not evil, right? Survival instinct, maternal instinct, these are all instincts. Okay, so the idea of animal sacrifice is to find the animal in you and to dedicate it to God. So what you're saying by this is the productive side of me should be identified with the cut off productive side of this person. So I should see this person's death as a tragedy. Okay, clear? So to understand this more, okay, um, today 
people oftentimes feel that humans have the right to determine whether somebody's life is worth living or not. You're familiar with this? So what makes them say someone's life is worth living? Picture someone who's 95 and on life support. Why would they say this person's life is not worth living? Oh, exactly. They're not productive and they're not having fun. So we've reduced the formula for the value of life to production and pleasure. Does life have any other purpose? Think about what we said about the base of the connection of the mind, the heart, and the body. Does life have any other purpose? So we would say until our life has intrinsic purpose, not just extrinsic purpose. It's not just about what you could do, it's about being. So this ritual has to do with the affirmation of this. You cut off a life. It's more than cutting off a calf's head. Don't you get it? OK, clear? OK, so that was the last halacha that Yaakov learned with Yosef. So the question we have now is, and how did Yaakov know halacha? This is way before the Torah was given. How did the Avos know any halacha? So the answer is, and I want you to understand this, because this will also give you insight into the level of morality that you have the right to expect from the non-Jewish world that didn't receive Torah. The first human, Adam, was created knowing. We all have what's called integral knowledge. So it would mean if you were anywhere in the world and you were traveling on a bus, and you would see somebody take a scissor out and cut off somebody else's braids. With, okay, <laughs> snip, snip. Could you see where most people would see this as inappropriate? Yeah. Why? Where's that coming from? Ah, instinctively, we have some capacity for not being achzar. You understand this? Instinctively, we have the capacity not to be achzar. And Adam was created that way. He was created knowing. He was created knowing on a higher level than we are. Okay, so his level of knowledge of the rules of the game were passed on. So ultimately, they're referred to as the seven Noahide laws. So these laws are instinctive. They don't have to be learned from a book. Seven what laws? Noahide laws, meaning Noah knew these laws. So what are they? Don't murder. If you value your own life, you could figure out it's a bad idea to murder somebody else, right? Don't steal. If you treasure your own possessions, you should be smart enough to figure out that what? So does he. Next, don't commit adultery, incest, all of that stuff. Because if you treasure your own relationships, you could know better than to do this. Don't rip a limb off a living animal. How should you know that? Because you want to honor God for yourself. Yeah, because physically, we're animals. Spiritually, we're not, but physically, we're animals. OK, next. OK, don't curse God. Our belief in God is instinctive. And I want to give you a proof of this, by the way. Has there ever been, did any of you study sociology or anthropology? OK, you seem, un, you seem undecided. You either did or didn't. No, I did, okay. but like one class. Oh, one class. There's never been a society that started off as non-believing. Did you know this? You have to be taught not to believe. Isn't that interesting? So like in Micronesia, in Africa, in Australia, in the outback, places that have not been touched by the Judeo-Christian ethic, they all are believers. Atheism has to be taught. And I want to tell you why. It's simple, because our picture of reality comes from what we observe. And nobody ever saw anything make itself. OK, clear? So looking and saying that there's a creator and then cursing the creator because the creator doesn't do things according to your will is something we could figure out. Next, OK. Um, murder. Idol worship. OK. If you made an idol in the morning, you could figure out it didn't make you. If you made it, it didn't make you. And the last one is having a legal system. How could people intuit that, which also is one of the universal statements of morality. In Papua New Guinea, which is like the most primitive of all civilizations that contemporarily exist, how do they do justice? Do you know? It's so I find this so interesting, because it's instinctive. They have what's called a longhouse, which is like a, literally a longhouse, where the elders will sit and judge cases. OK, clear? 
Now, where does this desire to judge come from? We all start out weak and helpless. Is that true? So a justice system, by definition, is something where the weak are defended against the strong. So those are, those are our expectations from other human beings. So this was the last halacha Yaakov taught Yosef. And because the word egel, which means calf, is a play of words on the word agala, which means wagon, Yosef sent him wagons that were drawn by egels to show him what? what was, why, why was Yosef interested in having Yaakov know that he still remembered their final lesson? Okay, in order that Yaakov know that Yosef is the same Yosef that he saw last when Yosef was 17. Okay, because if he wasn't, it would be such a spiritual danger to put himself in a position of dependency on Yosef that he wouldn't have gone there. Okay, clear? So, bottom line here, bottom line, don't be an achzar, right? Don't be estranged. Okay, do feel when you're, in, when you're enmeshed in something that there's some level of accountability. Do feel accountability for your choice. Don't be afraid of bad consequences because even the worst of consequences ultimately are dictated by Hashem. Hashem's not achzar. He's not estranged. Okay? So who...